Welcome back warriors, Quay Tansei Sego. Hi, my name is Pam Palmeter and welcome to my YouTube channel where we focus on educating the resistance and inspiring the next generation of warriors to help us save our peoples and the planet. An issue of great concern during this pandemic is whether the measures being implemented by different countries are consistent with the basic human rights of their citizens and the sovereign native nations within their borders. The United Nations and various special rapporteurs have called on all countries to ensure that their pandemic measures are consistent with human rights and tailored to the needs of groups more vulnerable to pandemics. Today, we get to talk to the Chief Commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission about what all of this means in a Canadian context. So stay tuned to learn more. Canada, while our COVID-19 numbers are not as bad as those in the United States, we still have not been able to flatten the curve for the spread of the virus. Provinces like Quebec and Ontario continue to lead in infections. There have also been outbreaks in more than 23 First Nations, all of whom are working really hard to prevent the kind of massive outbreak being felt by the Navajo Nation, which has over 2,700 confirmed cases and 88 deaths. We know that human rights are absolutely essential to being able to live in a safe, healthy and just society. In fact, the absence of human rights protections and enforcement can be a matter of life and death at any time, but even more so during a pandemic. National crises like the pandemic here in Canada have shown us all how deep-rooted inequalities in society serve to place certain groups at far greater risk of infection. But even beyond the health implications, this pandemic has impacted people in terms of their socioeconomic conditions like employment, education, childcare, public services, financial security, and even housing. That's why it is so important that we have human rights organizations to do the really hard work of not only addressing formal complaints, but engaging in the monitoring of governments and holding them accountable for human rights protections and enforcement. They also engage in the important advocacy work that helps to educate others and pressure governments to address these human rights issues. One of those organizations is the Canadian Human Rights Commission. The current Chief Commissioner is Marie-Claude Landry, who was appointed to her role in 2015. Marie-Claude is a lawyer who received her law degree from the Université de Sherbrooke and went on to found her own law firm of Landry Boucher & Associates. She has also been recognized with numerous awards and honors, including the title of Lawyer Emeritus and the Merit Award from the Barreau de Bedford. I am very pleased to be able to sit down with her today and talk about the importance of human rights protections, especially during pandemics. Bienvenue and welcome to my YouTube channel, Marie Claude. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very excited being uh, with you today. Thanks. Um, so you are the Chief Commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Can you tell us a little bit about what does the Commission do and what's your role? Yeah, for sure. And uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission is more than 40 years old now, established by Parliament in 1977. Uh, we are the Canadian Human Rights uh, Watchdog and uh, the Canada's uh, Human Rights uh, National Institution. We operate, and that's very, very important, we operate independently of, uh, of the government. And for, for me, that's really key to our mandate. We promote and protect human rights in this country and we monitor what's going on in terms of human rights uh, as a national institution. And uh, we make sure that Canada, uh, we, we check on Canada uh, to look if they meet their uh, international obligation in terms of, uh, of human rights. We're the federal uh, human rights uh, institution, meaning that there is provincial commissions and territorial commission and the federal commissions. 
as well. Then the Federal Commission is much more on a national basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of protection, it's for services uh, um, under federal jurisdiction. Um, I think that many people are uh, most familiar with the protection mandate that we have through the complaint uh, system. Mm -hmm. Then if you face some discrimination, you um, you can file a complaint through our online complaint form uh, on our website or any other way that you uh, you may want to file a complaint. We're going to investigate the complaint and uh, we, we are called more importantly a screening body then what we do is we investigate the complaint we looked at it and we decide if uh, it's in public interest to refer that to the tribunal or not this is this is the the big chunk of our uh, protection mandate and in terms of of uh, promotion and prevention what we're doing is sometimes we provide advice on laws and policies and programs by engaging and collaborating with some other stakeholders. Uh, we, um, we, I'm often, I'm going and I appear in front of some uh, House of Commons or Senate committee to provide the advice or our expertise and making sure then when, when they, uh, when they looked at some, uh, um, uh, draft legislation or, or bills that they keep the human rights lands because it's so important, you know. I think that it's, uh, it's key to everything. It's making sure that the human rights lands uh, still there when you are looking on policies, programs, or, or laws that the, the parliament wants uh, to pass, in fact. Um, as a chief commissioner, I'm the CEO of the, of the organization and I work with my leadership team to provide um, uh, or decide, I would say, that our strategy and how we're going to are we going to move forward? Where and what should be our priority? Uh, provide day-to-day -day oversight, in fact, and uh, as well as a commissioner, I'm a decision uh, decision maker, and I have others commissioner uh, commissioners. Uh, some are full time. I have the the. the this president, or what we call the uh, deputy chief commissioner, and uh, I have a full-time commissioner as well. We have some part-time commissioner who are they are doing some uh, decision making. My job, I would say, uh, and the most important uh, part of my job is to understand what Canadians expect from the commission. Understand what are their their situation, uh, what they are facing, uh, what kind of uh, of emergent issues that we have in terms of human rights in this country, which is very important, you know. My job, I strongly believe it's speaking out about human rights issues, making sure that I make calls for action to government. And some example of that is after the uh, election in 2015, that I make a call for action to address some of the most uh, urgent and, and, and important issues in terms of human rights in this country. Uh, my job is to meet with stakeholders coast to coast to coast in Canada to hear, listen, understand their expectation, making sure that we have this connection. I always say that I don't feel that my job is at the 10th floor uh, of, my, of, uh, of the, uh, my building in Ottawa. My job is being out there and speaking with the stakeholders, making sure that they know I'm there for them. Uh, and this is what I've done. You know, when I've been appointed in 2015, my first thing was to travel coast to coast to coast to meet with First Nation uh, uh, communities uh, and many other stakeholders to hear what they expect, how we are relevant for them, why we're relevant for them, how we can do better to address their concern. Uh, and, and, and for me, that really, really important. Uh, and I, I try to keep in mind often that for me, democratic development requires more than just development of democratic institutions. It requires respect for human rights in a country. And I'm the kind of person that I strongly believe that we never, never should accept silence towards violation for human rights. We need to, to it's, and I don't think that being in my job is a popularity contest. Being in my job is making sure that I'm going to speak out for what I believe is not 
the right things and what I believe it's, it's the right thing that should be done, in fact. Well, I think that's, you know, so important to hear. Sometimes, you know, we hear about organizations and they're set up and there's a lot of fanfare when they're originally set up. And then over time, people don't know what they're doing because they're not engaged. So you being out there, being engaged with the actual people who are impacted when human rights are, uh, you know, protected or not protected. I think that's critical. I mean, that's, that's more important information than just say academic research or statistical research, but actually hearing from the people who are impacted. So I really appreciate um, hearing that. And I also know that over the years in the work that I've done, uh, we'll have lots of interactions with the Canadian Human Rights Commission in an educational context, you know, doing joint events or, or seeing representatives at the United Nations, at the various human rights treaty bodies, you know, wherever we're having a conversation about human rights. It's always good to know that the Canadian Human Rights Commission is there and for Canadians who don't know how independent it is that this isn't just an arm of government who has to say whatever the government of the day is saying, but that you're truly a champion for human rights. And I'm, I'm wondering, how did you get into this role? I mean, we know that, you, you know, you, you have a law background, but law can take you in a wide variety of, of you know, travels and paths. How did you, or when did you decide that you wanted to focus on human rights? I would say that my personal and professional lives have been always been guided by core values like equality, dignity, and respect. For me, it's really, really important. I, I grew up in Quebec, Bassin Laurent region. Uh, and in fact, I have done my, my law degree in Sherbrooke. And um, I would say that I, Probably for many of uh, the people who are seeing me or uh, read a little bit, the, I have a relatively um, uh, homogeneous uh, background. But, you know, I often say as well that when you see the cover of a book, you didn't see what's in, inside the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't faced racism myself, uh, for sure, but I, I have cried for my daughter, uh, who is uh, Mexican heritage, and my grandchild, who is. Uh, who is black from uh, Asian heritage. And they have been subject to racism and comments, and I faced that. And this, it was really, and it's still heartbreaking for me. My grandson is nine years old and is, is facing some situation that are unacceptable in my view. And, uh, you know, myself as a woman, for sure, I enjoy a successful career in law. Uh, but I had to defend, you know, 35 years ago or 30, 30 years ago, I had to defend myself against gender stereotype mm -hmm. and judgment while, while I was building my practice. Um, I, <laughs> I experienced many things that women have experienced as well um, and challenges to uh, be in business in the world of, of men. Um, I've not lived the challenge of a single mother myself, but certainly as a woman that I, I, I founded my own law firm, I had to make uh, some heartbreaking choice at some point between my work and my family. And uh, I'm still often just looking back in my past and uh, I'm still emotional about that because it should never happen. You should never have to make a choice in between your... Uh, your uh, professional life and your personal life and your family, you know, and I remember to make sure that I will not be targeted and put aside for, uh, for opportunities and things like that, to, that I have to hidden the fact that, or not hidden, but just not talk about the fact that uh, I had three kids at home. Uh, and uh, I remember that the first, the first day when my, my, my last daughter went to the, uh, to the, uh, the school for the first time that it's my former associate who drove her at school because I was in front of a judge and at this time you can you know back backward through 26 years ago it was not possible to say to the judge I sorry Mr. Justice can we be a little bit late because I have to bring my daughter at school it was just not acceptable in 2015 
I was pretty busy leading a law firm that I formed back in uh, 1993 in Counsville, Quebec. I was working, thriving. Uh, my family was healthy. I was just uh, been reappointed as senior and a person of the correctional institution for another five years, you know, and the position that I was doing in addition to my home uh, law uh, practice. And um, it was great. But when this opportunity arose in my life, you know, I felt that if I didn't take it, I will regret it forever. Mm -hmm. I will regret because it was an opportunity for me to work at what drove me into my law degree, helping people and join my voice in the fight for human rights and, and, and doing what I believe is right, you know. And for me, it's always something that really drove me to do my law. You know, I didn't come from a, a family of, of doctors or lawyers. I'm pretty... Uh, I'm coming from a very average family uh, and really what drove me in law, it's, it's being there and being able to use the tool that the law degree will provide to me to help people. Then I took a close look at what was important for me in my personal and my professional lives. And I believe, uh, as I mentioned, in respect, I believe that people should work together uh, and we're stronger together. Mm -hmm. Together, I believe that everyone, everyone deserves to be heard. Everyone deserves to be treated as a human being. And human rights are not just for some, but they are for all. And we should, we 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 should all feel that we belong. Mm -hmm. And we 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 all deserve respect. Then when I've been called to uh, serve this wonderful organization, I decided to say yes, even though if it was uh, not an easy decision, because you know my family is still in the Eastern Township, I have to give up my law firm that I really founded, and it was uh, it was. But I really felt at that time that was the right things to do, and. I often say, and people who surround me know that, you know, there is not, it's now five years and two months. And there is not one day that I didn't thank of being in this job. And doesn't mean that I didn't face challenges. Doesn't mean that it's not difficult. Doesn't mean that sometime when I visited stakeholders and First Nation and that I didn't find that difficult of what I, I'm seeing there. But it's give me so much of inspiration to move forward and continue to fight for human rights and respect and making sure that people will feel that human rights and rights are there for them as well. And that's important. Mm -hmm. Every morning when I'm walking to the office, every morning when I'm traveling, I say thanks for being in this job. And I'm surrounded by wonderful people that they're so committed and so engaged and so passionate, you know. Then I feel very lucky of being in this job. And each and every time that I'm visited or I, I talk with stakeholders or I meet with them and I'm seeing what they are doing with few things, but what they can achieve mm -hmm. for me, it's, it's really a source of inspiration. And I have a background that I've been very involved in, in, in volunteer work here. And I, I, I've been very involved in my community. And I believe that this is the only way that we can make things happen. It's through being engaged and, and making sure that we, we take what we have been offered as a gift to be healthy and to, for me, I feel that having the chance to have my law degree, it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. And with this privilege, you have to do something with that. And this is what I'm seeing when I visit some student or I, I give some speeches to pro bono students or other students in faculties of law and, 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 and other faculties. I say that you, ha you are privileged. And privilege, I didn't talk about money. I didn't talk, think about the, uh, you come from a rich family. What I'm talking about privilege is being a privilege to be 
in university, then you have to do something with that. Wow. I mean, uh, for all the different ways and all the different paths that you could have followed, I'm pretty thankful that your path led you here because we all know that social justice work generally is not easy. It's hard. You never reach a stage in human rights where, oh, there, we have it. We have the law we need and now we're good. We never have to worry again because laws can be changed and laws can be ignored and not enforced. So it's like a constant struggle that you have to continue to monitor and and you know hold governments to account so thank you for all the different ways in which you know it's led you here and that you're continue to be inspired by this work as opposed to discouraged by it and help share you know that view to help inspire other people and uh so with regards to you know human rights generally um, and you know, we'll also talk about the specific ones in the Canadian Human Rights Act, but just generally, why do you think human rights are so important? Why is it important for Canadians to you know, know their human rights? And, and why is any society, um, should there be a foundation of human rights? Uh, it's a good question. It's an important question. And for me, simply put, is human rights matter because every person deserves to be treated fairly, no matter, no matter who they are. Every person should feel that they belong. For me, it's, it's, it's about as well understanding that we are more than the label that people put on us. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are in a world where people just sometimes are seeing others with the labels. And, and, and for me, again, and I know that this is something that is very strong at the commission and we are all engaged, it's we should look beyond labels. And, and everyone, everyone should have access to justice justice as i mentioned at the beginning it's not about justice just for some mm -hmm. it's justice for all and we're all human being and i think that as canadian we can be pr we can be proud we achieve a lot but we still have our our own challenges we still have a lot of challenges in canada there is places that i visited and it's like the third world war country then people didn't have a clear drinking water, didn't have proper housing, they didn't have food security. Uh, they, they, cannot, they, can have, they cannot have access to health services. And there is so many things that need to be addressed that for me, human rights still important will be forever important. We should always consider human rights as a core value, as a second nature, as something that we all care for. There is no, I often mention to students and people that I met with, that you didn't need to be at the head of any organization to talk about human rights. Human rights, it's in everything that we are doing every day with people who surround us, with our families, with our friends, within our work. It's everywhere. And everything should be seen through a human rights lens. We can talk about security. We can talk about safety. We can talk about a lot of things. But it's not in competition with human rights. It should coexist with human rights. And that's really important. And, and I think that when some people are at risk, we're all at risk. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. We need to understand that. We need to just also keep in mind what Simone de Beauvoir decades ago warned us about when she say, and I, I really quote, and because uh, it's an important quote, never forget that it will take one political, economic, or religious crisis for women's rights to be called in question. These rights are never heard. You have to remain vigilant throughout your life. And it's true for everything. It's true for everything. We always have to be vigilant. 
when we take human rights for granted, it's exactly like you when you take your health, mm -hmm. your good health for granted. Sometimes you lose it and the impact is huge. Then even though in this country, even though if we achieve a lot of good things, there is a lot of things that need to be addressed. A lot of issues need to be addressed. We have seen an increase of hatred. We have seen an increase of Islamophobia. We have seen an increase of racism. We have seen some women rights have been put in questions again. Then we need to be vigilant. Well, this I is think why human rights are important. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say that's it's so important that people understand that that we we've met. You can never just reach a stage where everything's good. That it, it's just one political movement or one populist movement or one you know change or shift in society or a crisis or you know it, literally anything can be the catalyst for people to start questioning human rights, questioning the economics of human rights or the value of human rights, or it become politicized as opposed to being what it should be, like an apolitical you know, foundation of any free, safe society. And so I think you know, your, your message about human rights being important and it does impact everyone, even if you're not thinking about it, um, it, it can and does impact you. And so, I noticed that different human rights organizations or institutions might cover different different categories of human rights. So for example, at the United Nations, there's a whole bunch of different treaty bodies. Some focus on women's rights, some focus on children's rights, some focus on indigenous rights. And I'm wondering if you can just share with all the viewers a bit about the kinds of rights that are within the Canadian Human Rights Act. Um, I know you said there's a difference between federal and provincial and yeah. territorial, but what are the kinds of rights specifically that are protected in the Canadian Human Rights Act? Yeah, absolutely. Much of the uh, CHRI, the Canadian Human Rights Act, is about protecting people from discrimination. The Commission receives complaints, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, this conversation, uh, complaints of discrimination uh, that they are based on 13 grounds, protect, uh, 13 protected grounds, sorry, such as race, religion, sex, or disability. The Commission can deal with complaints about employment or provision of services where this is within federal jurisdiction, for example, complaints against federal government, department or agency, where it concerns First Nations or where it's against uh, the federally regulated private uh, sector, such as bank, telecommunication, border, airport, airline company, uh, and, and, and I can I can go on. Um, this can include these issues of civil and political rights. For example, the right uh, not to be arbitrarily detained by uh, the police as a result of uh, racial profiling, or um, issues of economic, uh, social, and cultural rights. For example, the right to equi uh, equitable and adequate social services like education or child welfare services on First Nation Reserve. Um, we all heard about the first, uh, the, uh, the, uh, child welfare case. In fact, this is a good example of that. As I mentioned earlier, as Canada's national human rights institution, the commission also has much broader mandate to promote and protect all human rights and freedoms in Canada uh, that include all human rights enshrined in both domestic laws and in the international human rights laws to which Canada is party, such as the Convention of Rights of, of the Child, uh, that the, the Canadian Human Rights Commission will, uh, will report uh, to the United Nations this year at the uh, Periodic Universal Review on Canada Performance, or another example could be the United, uh, uh, United Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Person, as an example. This is, this is the kind of, uh, of work that uh, we're doing uh, and we have been mandated to do um, by the Canadian Human Rights Act. We collaborate as well uh, with stakeholders and with, amongst the stakeholders, there is the Provincial and Territorial Human Rights Commissions. Uh, 
And we have an association who is called, and you may be familiar or not with, uh, but Kashra. It's an important, uh, it's an important organization, and we all work together to uh, improve human rights in Canada. We can have challenges or issues with human rights in BC or in Quebec, but it's all human rights. Human rights should be the same all across Canada, coast to coast to coast, and. Uh, for me, it's this is uh, this is our work. We we monitor what's going on in terms of uh, human rights in Canada, and we're doing that in collaboration with stakeholders as our uh, counterparts in provincial and territorial um, place mm -hmm. in Canada. Well, I think that's really uh, another important point for Canadians to understand that you know there is a formal complaint process, and there's a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal that you know hears different cases. But in addition to that, the Canadian Human Rights Commission also speaks out and makes statements when they see that something in society is happening that looks like it could impact human rights. You sometimes see statements from the Canadian Human Rights Commission saying, hey, you know, make sure government that you're taking into account the human rights here. And I think that's important because it shows that the Canadian Human Rights Commission isn't just about a complaints process like a court, for example, um, where you'd never see a court making public statements yeah. about what should or shouldn't happen. But really, there's that advocacy role as well as being a dispute resolution mechanism. And I think that's so important that Canadians understand that that's part of it. Now, you've mentioned, you know, First Nations in terms of, you know, people that you meet and um, talk to and get their feedback. You've also mentioned the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous yeah. Peoples, and that was going to be one of my questions. So within the broad Canadian Human Rights Commission framework, how do Indigenous rights fit into all of that? Because Indigenous rights are also human rights. Um, and we're just wondering, you know, is it a, it, how they fit into that kind of framework? Um, thank you for your question. You probably, uh, so, or you certainly know that when Parliament first enacted the uh, CHRE in 1977, it left a significant, significant gap in uh, in the human rights protections for people living on First Nations reserves, uh, and it took 30 years to correct this historic error. Uh, since that time, we have been encouraged certainly to see more and more Indigenous people assessing their pathway to human rights justice provided by the, uh, the Canadian Human Rights Act. And it's important for years that the Commission has recognized the need for reconciliation and that human rights issues as, uh, facing human rights, uh, Indigenous people, sorry, in Canada are among the most pressing issues in this country. And there's still issues such as access, as I, I mentioned before, to clear drinking water, adequate housing, education, child and family services on reserve, and access to justice. These are fundamental, fundamental human rights issues uh, in need of immediate redress. And I mentioned often and uh, that indigenous issues are not just indigenous issues they are canadians issues they are things that canadians should care about and we need to resolve this this is a canadian problem and it's have been uh, it's have been recognized by by many and uh, and this is what we have to uh, take in consideration this is not just about indigenous problem it's about canadian problem that we need to address um, for me uh, certainly uh, we know that the collective rights of indigenous people are the individual rights of indigenous person of all ages and genders and will never be adequately safeguarded or properly uh, properly fulfilled unless indigenous people are able to make their own decision uh, through their own institutions and according to their own values and traditions the rights to self-determination and other human rights, such as uh, those articulated in the CHRA, in the Canadian Human Rights Act, are interrelated and interdependent. To improve one is to improve others. This is exactly what I mentioned a few minutes ago. To deny one is to deny others. Fighting for human rights 
can eliminate the need for self-government and provide more evidence of the arms that stem for colonization and oppression. In turn, progress towards self-government can help increase access to human rights justice and to reduce human rights violation. And that's really important. On a concrete and very concrete level, I've seen the arcs of these things lean together, bending towards human rights, including self-determination and self-government in both small and large ways. For example, when we litigated the First Nation Child and Family Services case alongside the AFN and Caring Society and others, we heard evidence, we heard evidence of the need for greater self-government of these services on reserve. This demonstrates that human rights legislation and processes can be used to leverage work towards increase the recognition and advancement of self-determination and self-government and in the process to improve human rights for all indigenous peoples in Canada. And that's key. That's key for me. Well, and so true. I mean, there's, if you look over the years, people have often seen indigenous rights as somehow separate and unrelated to human rights, but they are in fact human rights. I mean, one of the only reasons why we had to have a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples saying we have human rights is to make it very clear to states that we have these basic, and these are all minimum rights, these are minimum standards. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that when all of the different indigenous groups from around the world were working on the United Nations Declaration and you know laying out all of the different articles, that one of the first articles was that all of the human rights protections from all of the international human rights instruments would be specifically incorporated into the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a very clear indicator that Indigenous peoples have human rights too. And your point about, you know, it's all interrelated and there's intersectionality. There's so many different layers of human rights for Indigenous peoples. It could be, you know, racism and sexism or ageism. You know, there's so many different things. And it's very there's a lot of and yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think those are all really important points. And clearly with the... Uh, First Nation Child and Family Caring Society case at the Canadian Human Rights Commission uh, or at the tribunal, they really highlighted how important human rights are in, in terms of being a lever, a lever for justice and a lever for self-determination because Indigenous peoples have their own laws too, their own forms of, you know, Indigenous rights and Indigenous laws. And I think the self-determination is really important. And one of the things that we're dealing with in terms of self-determination right now in a First Nation context is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, all Canadians, everyone in the world is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And because there's been, rightfully so, such a focus on the health component, you know, the rate of infect, uh, infections and the, the rate of deaths and how it's being spread, Sometimes we forget about the human rights implications of a national crisis or a pandemic like COVID-19. Now, some of the United Nations human rights bodies and special rapporteurs have been making very specific calls to countries around the world to say that in your emergency pandemic measures, don't forget that there has to be a human rights framework as, as the foundation. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how important is it that we have a human rights lens to all of these pandemic measures that are being put in place? Oh, for sure. It's a human rights crisis, and that's really important. And almost overnight, COVID-19 has forced us to navigate our way through an unprecedented time uncertain time and history have taught us that times at great crisis the best and the worst part of a nation are revealed on one hand we see the kindness of stranger and the strengths of our communities but also also we see cracks in our society being exposed the inequality and systemic discrimination that was always always there but amplified 
we must not take our human rights for granted. This is what I mentioned at the beginning of this interview. It's we should remain vigilant. That's key to everything, and that's key to keep a democratic society and, and have prosperity and have a healthy country. And when we see the question, uh, uh, sorry, when we see this, for me, the question is how to respond. What should we do? Recently, we know that the UN Secretary General Antonio Guerreras released a statement where he said that people and their rights must be front and center. A human rights lens put everyone in the picture and ensures that no one, no one is left behind. And I agree. I agree. We know that each person we meet is complex and multifaceted. They are much more than the label. We should look beyond label. Their distinct combination of identities, intersecting characteristics, and unique person history influence their life experience in profound ways. And we should always keep that in mind. We are certainly seeing that during this time. The measures of our society put in place to deal with the pandemic need to respond to the needs of individuals in all of their diversity to ensure that no one, no one is left behind and everyone again feel that they belong. Looking at the present situation through a human rights lens allow us to view in, sorry, to view it in a comprehensive and holistic manner, including all of its political, economical, and cultural and social dimensions. An individual's rights are not achieved in isolation. Rather, they are influenced by fulfillment of the rights of others, such as family and community members. Now, and as we emerge from the crisis, all governments must ensure that they have looked seriously, carefully, thoughtfully at these holistic impacts and that legislation, policies, services, and programs aim at supporting Canadians and bringing our economy back to health, have human rights principle back in. That's key to everything. That's important. We need to make sure that policies, program, and things that will be developed do not create more barriers. This is a great opportunity, actually, to change for the best. Crisis bring challenges, difficulties, and hard time for people. But they also created opportunities then we need to think about that and keep a human rights lines in everything that we will put in place when we will recover of this. As we should keep a human rights lens during this crisis. Well, I, exactly. And I think, you know, uh, what you were talking about here is that a human rights lens means that we have to focus on the different situations of people in society who may have been suffering long historical discrimination or exclusion or oppression over time so that a one size fits all, you know, response mm -hmm. might look great on the surface, but in fact could further serve to disadvantage. And so I really, you know, I really take your point that in, in all the good responses that we're all trying to come up with, we have to make sure that we're not disadvantaging people or creating other barriers. And can you think of any, you know, general examples of how a human right could be breached during a COVID pandemic, for example, or d during a measure in any country, in any place? Oh, we are seeing a lot. We can open the newspaper and we're seeing a lot. And, and for me, it's crystal clear that the virus that does not discriminate. Everyone are impacted and the, the virus didn't do any discrimination with people. 
And as the current situation evolves, the number of people put in vulnerable circumstances will grow, have, been, have grown a lot and will grow. People who before the COVID were just managing to keep their head above the water are now finding it nearly impossible to get by. Barriers to equality are much higher. I've made a statement or many statements. In fact, I think that I issue five statements since the beginning of this crisis, pointing out how people who were in situations of vulnerability, now their situation just have been aggravated dramatically. And for some that cost their life. And that's really important to keep in mind. The disparity between people with advantage and those without is wider, you know, and that's important. Now more than ever, people living in vulnerable circumstances need that we stand up all together for them. They need our support. The example that I could provide are numerous, but I can give you a few. Women, Women are among the hardest hit by the pandemic. Social and economic barriers have been amplified for racialized women, indigenous women, migrant women, women with low income, single mothers, and LGBTQ women, and women with disabilities or mental health issues. The current situation has put women at greater risk to loss, to, uh, sorry, of, lo of job loss, Domestic violence, we know we hear about that. Many of the frontline workers being called upon to serve and support their communities are predominantly women. Some are the poorest paid people in the country. These are essential jobs in healthcare, food service, cleaning, customer service, and caregiving often provide no option, no option for sick leave or working from home. Social distancing and quarantine measures have been meant that many women have had to continue working while caring for children with little or often no support. People with disabilities in our society have always faced many barriers related to accessibility in their daily lives. Not all communications surrounding COVID-19 have been done in an accessible format, or not all services, including health services, are accessible. Refilling a medication, getting groceries, or fresh air may not be possible. We should think that maybe social distanciation is not possible for certain persons with disabilities. Many indigenous peoples, are now facing greater challenges. For example, overcrowding in housing makes social distancing impossible, since self-isolation, quarantine issue, is an issue. In northern, remote, isolated, and urban communities, there may be 10 people living in the space designed for two or three, when it's not more. Housing in despair also serves to support transmission of respiratory illness. Black Canadians and other racialized people are bearing the burden of increased social inequalities since COVID. From inequality in access to health care and housing to inequality of economic opportunity to over-policing. In short, we are witnessing the manifestation of a structural racism in Canada. I was just speaking at an event last Friday, saying that a vast majority, certainly in the area of Montreal, as an example, of racialized people are at the front are on the front line of healthcare services, actually, in long care facilities and in the hospital, and they are at risks. And that's a big issue. At the same time, the people of Asian origin have been targeted of racist taunt, threats and intimidation in public and online and physical violence. This is both an issue of public safety and fundamental, fundamental human rights. No one should feel threatened or unwelcome because of the color of their skin or where they are coming from. We are not safe unless we are all safe 
and this is what we should keep in mind. This is not a time for division. It's a time to stand all together. That's important. And the last thing I would say on this point, for me, it is that COVID-19 crisis has placed a spotlight on vital importance of protecting economic and social rights, often overlooked as just judiciable rights in Canada. Never before, never before has the importance of responsibility of government to protect people by guaranteeing the economic and social rights have been so clearly demonstrated. This is not about charity, not at all. It is about survival. This is about survival. It is. I mean, it's the whole crisis has forced many people to think about what's within the scope of human rights. And, you know, economic and social rights are so critical. Think about health, health care and health conditions that, you know, socioeconomic conditions, whether or not you have an education, whether or not you have access to health care, those kinds of things lead directly to the quality of health that you have, for example. And so all of those things, I know they're difficult to talk about, and I know that um, there are struggles that we currently face, but I think it's important. It's how we move beyond, it's how we make things better by actually confronting you know, the long list. And there's many, many more things that could comprise a, you know, a human rights violation or a human rights issue during this pandemic, even without pandemics. And yeah. You know, you're doing great work at the commission, all of the people that you work with. There's lots of human rights organizations, you know, formal ones and informal grassroots organizations that are promoting human rights. But I'm wondering before you leave us, because I know you're really busy, do you have any advice for what Canadians can do to help protect human rights of everybody during COVID-19? I would say first that I think that we need extra passions, we need extra kindness, we need to stand together. It can be easy to be overwhelmed in the face of crisis like this, to not know where to begin to help. It's difficult, it's challenging. But as I often tell to younger audience, you can start with simple everyday actions that make difference. It could look simplistic, but it's not. This is something that we can all do. People can start their own in their own backyard with their own family, their own community to be engaged and to, to help. As we face these challenges, we must stand all together to support each other in line with the Canada, Canadian concept of care mongering. It's important. I encourage everyone to turn their energy to helping those who are in the greatest need. There are, there are a lot. And sometimes we're seeing that when we, when sometimes we feel discouraged and we feel that times are hard, but when we look at others and we look at what others experience, maybe we find that we're not that in, a, in a, that bad position, mm -hmm. you know, and we must ensure that we strike the appropriate balance between protecting public health and safety and respecting human rights. It's so easy, it's so easy to say that, okay, we have to protect, to protect public health, we have to, we, we have to take care of safety and we put aside human rights. But for me, public health and safety is about human rights. It's all together. It's not separating. It's not once against the others. It should be all together. We must be fully mindful of how this crisis is amplifying the challenges and disadvantage faced by people living on the margins of society. And we must look with, within ourselves, check our own bias and assumption and be mindful about them. And this is, this is, that's not easy, but this is something that we should keep in mind as well, that we all have biases. Mm -hmm. We all have unconscious biases and we need to address it. As this crisis has evolved, 
we all have witnessed this effect on our family, our friends, our neighbors, and our communities. The pandemic has exposed the structural inequalities in the society in which we live, even here in Canada. As we move through this time and as we recover from, from it, we need to acknowledge that we have seen the renew of our commitment to the principles of substantive equality, dignity, and respect that are so very Canadian. And dignity, equality, and respect for all, not just for some. This is may seem obvious, but it's not. And this is why it's important to keep that in mind every day. Then I think that this is my message. We need to be passion. We need to have extra kindness. We need to stand all together. This is the only way that we're going to survive and be in a better position after than we are now. That's a great message. And what I like most about it is you don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a doctor. You can fully engage in practices of human rights by engaging in acts of kindness, helping to take care of your neighbor, family members, community members. We've seen so many great examples from people. Sometimes we think about human rights as, well, that's the the government's job and it's true it is the government's job but it's all of our responsibility to to hold ourselves accountable and so we've seen first nations acting on their self-determination taking measures to protect their own communities we've seen community volunteers walk around the community and check on elders deliver groceries deliver cleaning supplies mow people's lawns we've seen kids bake cookies and help take out the garbage for people in need. And that's, that's exactly, you know, your message, that's your message in action. And I think, you know, if we can focus on that kind of message of kindness and our own individual responsibility, as well as holding the government to account, then we'll be able to get through this crisis and make mm -hmm. Canada better at the end of the day. And I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here and sharing with all Canadians um, and indeed the world, anyone who's watching, all of the reasons why human rights are so important, what the Canadian Human Rights Commission is doing, your commitment to putting human rights into action um, and making it something that we all come together with, with kindness and a real firm commitment that human rights are for everybody. So. Thank you so much for coming on my YouTube channel and sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this important conversation. I wish you the best. Uh, and I wish all of us the best. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Bye-bye. Thank you all for watching my channel. I hope you really learned from Marie Claude's passionate plea for all Canadians to engage in acts of kindness during this pandemic and to think about how you can help respect and promote human rights in your daily life. I'll make sure to post a link to the Canadian Human Rights Commission's website in case you want to know more. Also, please let me know what you think about this series of video interviews focusing on human rights. Last week we talked to the Secretary General of Amnesty International in Canada, Alex Neve, and this week the Canadian Human Rights Commission's Chief Commissioner, Marie-Claude Landry. We also have more planned for the future. Are there other people you would like to hear from? Let me know and I'll see what we can do. If this is your first time on my channel, please consider subscribing, commenting, and sharing these videos with your families, friends, colleagues, and social justice allies. If you want additional resources, you can check out my website at www.pampalmeter.com. I wish you all health, safety, and shelter for you, your families, and nations while we continue to advocate for human rights protections for everyone during this pandemic. Till next time, stay alert, warriors. Walalia. We'll